started. So welcome to today's workshop demonstrating inclusivity and equity in your course. As our student population becomes more diverse, so too do our classrooms. Educators are encouraged to promote inclusivity and equity within the classroom culture to support an increasingly diverse student population. And in this workshop, we'll cover strategies and resources that will help you integrate inclusive and equitable practices and policies in your courses. I'm your presenter. Uh, I'm Amanda Smothers. I am the teaching and learning coordinator and uh, sharing responsibilities of the online learning coordinator for now in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. I earned my PhD from NIU in 2016. I've been teaching college English for about 13 and a half years, and I've been a faculty developer at NIU for a little over two and a half years now. Um, I'll take questions throughout and at the end of the presentation, so if you have any specific questions related to what we're discussing, feel free to post them. Um, or comment in the chat thread and I'll address them as they come up throughout. Uh, so let's get to know everyone who's here first. So in the text chat, just tell us what your department or division is, your role, um, and explain what you hope to get out of this workshop. And I'll share some of what you post to the chat, but I will uh, maintain your anonymity, so I won't mention your names. All right, so we've got biology represented and how to make courses more welcoming for all students. That's a great goal. accreditation assessment and evaluation, um, hopes to learn what faculty are learning about this topic for their work in supporting equity and assessment and for any future teaching that they may do themselves as well. Great. Uh, communications advisor, no set goal, but just interested more generally. It's an important topic. Excellent. Thank you. We have math uh, and a goal of making the course more welcoming, um, special education. Um, they think they have a pretty good toolbox as far as creating an inclusive environment, but would like to hear some more strategies. It's always good to, to expand on that. Um, another math person, how to work with diverse classrooms and, and policies. Um, we've got accountancy, how to make the course more welcoming. Excellent. Um, and if you are still typing in there, I still need to uh, share, you can do so. We'll just move into uh, the next part, which is just a check-in. I like to do this with my, with my students online. Um, so just share an emoji in the chat with how you're doing today. Um, and we've got another uh, kinesiology and physical education. Um, hopes to gain information on creating uh, an inclusive classroom environment across the curriculum. Great. So I will also participate in the emoji sharing. This is me on caffeine. Great, we've got some positive emojis here shared. This is just kind of a fun um, exercise you can use with your students to just to kind of gauge how they're doing today. Um, and that class period, you know, they might reveal they're not doing so great. So you might understand if they are a little bit more quiet that day um, and not participating as much as usual too. So the first thing that I want to talk about is what diversity has to do with it. Um, so I'm hoping that you know everyone who's here is interested in this, thinks it's valuable, but um, we'll still talk about, about what diversity has to do with it and why inclusive teaching. Um, so inclusive teaching is pedagogy that tries to serve all students' needs and support their learning and engagement. We want to expose students to diverse 
perspectives because it enriches their learning. It can help us elicit stimulating discussions. It can help us position learning within students' own cultural context. And there's this common misconception that inclusive teaching just means bringing up current events or issues of diversity into, for example, a math or a science course. Um, so you should offer diverse content, text, scenarios in those courses where they're relevant and they are relevant to every course. Um, however, that's not the only component to inclusive teaching. Inclusive teaching also involves focusing on your teaching methods and embracing student diversity in whatever forms it takes, including race, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic background, disability, ideology, personality traits, and so on, and then treating those diverse characteristics as assets in your classroom. So ultimately, traditional teaching methods don't necessarily serve all of our students well. Um, education can be an equalizer, but that's not a given. We, we do need to work hard to make it an equalizer by being inclusive educators and minimizing inequities so that students can succeed. Inclusive teaching can lead to a lot of positive changes, including narrowing achievement gaps, increasing student engagement, and helping students value our disciplines and our approaches to teaching and learning. So one common objection or concern maybe uh, to integrating inclusive teaching in our courses is that we just don't have time to do that. We have too much course content to get through in the semester. We couldn't possibly add one more thing to our plates. And we all think that we have a lot to cover. It's daunting to think about making changes, particularly if it takes time and effort that we feel that we don't have. Or maybe we're so stressed and overwhelmed, especially over the past year and a half, that we just don't have the bandwidth to think about how to add inclusivity and equity to our courses in meaningful ways. So to start out, you don't need to completely redesign your course right now. We aren't talking about reinventing the wheel here. Just start by considering some adjustments that you can make to your course that will help you retain or attract a diverse population of students to your course and by extension your discipline. So one small change is to make sure that your course reflects the diversity of our society and your, your students. Something as simple as selecting media that represents diversity in all of its forms and choosing required readings that reflect diversity in authorship and examples used that could help your curriculum become, become more representative of diverse voices and perspectives. And also pay attention to the authors and voices that you elevate in your courses. Make sure that you're prioritizing diverse viewpoints and experiences. Another small change uh, that you could use would be to, to use inclusive language in your classes. Acknowledge and respect your students. Use their identity terminology. It'll help them feel safer and more accepted in your classes, and it's going to increase your course's sense of community and connection, which is proven to increase persistence and success rates as well. Um, an additional way to tweak your course without overhauling it completely would be to ensure accessibility in your course material. If you haven't already, I do recommend you joining the Blackboard Ally pilot group so that you can have that Ally tool, tool enabled in your Blackboard courses. Um, the tool could help you identify documents that might have accessibility issues and help you fix those issues so that all students can benefit from your online course materials. And in addition, um, something that it does just for students, I mean, you can do this, you can use it too, but um, it provides students uh, with a valuable service. It allows them to access the documents that you upload in different formats, like HTML, which is easier to read on their smartphone, for example, um, or they can use, download an audio file um, or Braille. So there's, there's a lot of different formats that they can download. Um, so that they can use and encounter your course materials in a way that works best for them. Um, and then finally, one other adjustment you can make is to ensure your syllabus sets the tone for your course, reflect diversity and inclusion in the tone of your syllabus, and include inclusive syllabus policies, point students to supportive resources. What you can do is to include a diversity statement, um, and you can find examples of that on NIU's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Educators Toolkit, which I'll discuss. I'll show it a little bit in more detail later in the presentation, um, and I will also include that as a link in my follow-up email to everyone who's here today. So essentially, 
to be successful in integrating inclusivity and equity in our courses, we need to practice developing an inclusive mindset so we see every pedagogical decision that we make through that lens. So for each teaching decision we make, we need to consider who is being left out if I approach teaching in this way. Students vary in their ability to stay focused, to process what we're saying, to have identify key ideas in our lessons, to organize the information that we're providing to them in our lectures. And some faculty might think it's hand-holding or coddling students to provide, for example, a skeleton outline for a, for a lecture. However, providing a skeletal outline has been proven to help students focus and take effective class notes. At the very least, all of our students will have minimal notes that identify the main points of the lesson and show how those ideas fit together. But they will also learn from that expert demonstration, modeling of what a good structure for note taking is. Um, the students who don't have trouble with note taking may not need the skeletal outline, but it's not going to hurt them to receive it. Whereas the students who do have trouble with note taking will benefit greatly from having that resource and it will include them. So there's two um, perspectives that often get in the way of students learning. One is having a fixed mindset, which might manifest as a student saying, yeah, I'm, not, I'm just not a good writer. Writing just isn't my thing. I just can't do it. So students with a fixed mindset think that if they were going to be good writers, they'd be good already. They would have naturally developed that talent. So to counter that fixed mindset, you want to encourage a growth mindset in your classes. You want to help students recognize that intelligence and learning skills are not fixed or predetermined. They can be developed. Talk to students explicitly about growth mindset. Let them in on tasks that you found difficult as well. Convey how you overcome those difficulties by persisting and learning. Encourage students to use growth mindset language. So for example, instead of saying, I'm just not a good writer, have students get into the habit of saying, you know, I haven't developed good writing skills yet, but I will get there. That's that growth mindset. Another perspective that gets in the way of students learning is something that you may have heard before or even experienced yourself, and that's imposter syndrome. This is when we feel like a fraud despite our accomplishments or any evidence to the contrary. So for students, that might lead to them feeling like they don't really belong in college, uh, despite the fact that they were accepted on the basis of certain criteria that they met. And it's a common feeling, um, particularly among first generation college students like myself. Uh, so I still feel this way sometimes, maybe you do too. Um, I was the first person in my family to go to college, the first person to go to graduate school. Um, so one way to combat this feeling in students is to encourage them, to remind them that they do belong here. Um, I personally include an ally message in my syllabus. I read it on the first day of class. It explains that I want them to feel comfortable coming to me, that I'm safe and accepting, that they belong here, and that, you know, I was a first-generation college student too. So remind them that they belong throughout the semester. Sometimes we can forget, and those creeping feelings of being a fraud can sneak up on us when we least suspect them. So for example, you know, if a student gets a poor grade on an assignment or a test, help them figure out what they can do to improve. Give them the confidence to improve rather than allowing them to feel like it's proof that they don't belong. And if you're comfortable doing so, share a time when you experienced imposter syndrome. Share an experience where maybe you failed at something and what you did to pull yourself back up and work towards your goals. Be explicit about telling your students that they belong and that they can do well and grow. So I won't get too in-depth on universal design for learning. We've had um, whole workshops on universal design for learning, and you can probably, I'm not sure when our next one is, um, but you can probably find um, a recording of one of our previous ones on our YouTube channel. Um, but basically, it's another strategy for inclusive pedagogy. Um, so you want to consider UDL pr principles to make sure that all students are served by the learning experience. You don't have to go all out and redesign your course, but you could include some basic principles as you work towards making your course more inclusive. Um, so the essential tenets of UDL are to provide multiple means of engagement, the why of learning, multiple means of representation, the what, and then multiple means of action and expression, the how of learning. Um, so UDL has been 
classically understood as a way to improve the learning environment for students with disabilities, but the principles apply generally to creating a more inclusive classroom setting for all learners. So some ways to incorporate these principles in your course to make learning more uh, inclusive would be to create a course alignment map to make sure that you're aligning all of your course materials, instructional materials, and learning activities with your course learning outcomes. Um, and then you can share that alignment document with your students so that they understand why the course is designed the way that it is. Um, you can also figure out what your students already know and use that information to craft a learning experience that fits students. Uh, you can use formative and summative assessment. Formative assessments will help you see what students are actually learning. And that'll also help you monitor their progress toward their learning outcomes. Um, and it also allows you to modify your teaching approaches when you see that students maybe aren't progressing as you expected. Um, summative assessments, on the other hand, are going to help you with accountability and determining whether students have ultimately met those learning outcomes that you set forth. Also, one important thing um, to becoming an inclusive educator is to identify and reflect on your own teaching practices. So for example, there's tons of teaching practices inventories out there that you can take. Um, and taking one of those might help you identify your teaching habits and goals, see whether your teaching philosophy, so how you think about your teaching, um, you know, whether that actually matches your, your actual teaching style and practice, and then maybe whether your teaching style is the best approach to supporting student learning in your courses. Um, you could also take a teaching inventory that explicitly addresses the degrees of inclusivity in your syllabus, for example, or in your course design. And then, um, yes, I can, I can include links to those resources um, in my follow-up email. Um, so don't be afraid to change learning activities and assessments as needed. Uh, if students aren't reaching those learning outcomes or they aren't progressing in a way that they need to in order to eventually succeed on that, summative assessment, then use the data from formative assessments from your observations to reflect on what could be the causes of that um, and to come up with a plan to modify activities and assessments and better prepare students to meet course outcomes by the end of that course. Um, ideally, that should be done throughout the course rather than just waiting until the end of the course to assess, you know, how things went and make changes for the next semester. That'll definitely help next semester students, but that doesn't really do anything to help our current students succeed. And it kind of reflects a, a mentality of, um, you know, that this semester is just kind of a lost cause if it's not working out, uh, when that's not necessarily the case. We can always make adjustments. Something that's really important for inclusivity in your course is, to make personal connections with each of our students. So this doesn't mean becoming personal friends or, or crossing the boundaries of what's acceptable. What it does mean is that students feel seen, that students feel connected to both us as their educators and to the class as a whole. So we can create an inclusive classroom climate by learning about students' backgrounds, by establishing rules for discussion of controversial issues, by developing a deeper racial and socioeconomic awareness and helping students to also develop that awareness. Um, one small but meaningful step that you can take to create connections with students would be to share your gender pronouns on your syllabus um, and in your email signature line on Blackboard. That's just modeling inclusion by sending the message to students that your class is a safe space. Additionally, uh, you could learn or you should learn and use students' preferred or proper names. Ask them what they prefer to be called on the first day of class. Make note of that on your class roster if it's different. Also, go a step further and show students how to change their preferred or proper name in MyNIU. And let them know that their preferred or proper name will then show up on class rosters, the academic requirements report, grade rosters, the online directory, O365, and Blackboard. And also let students know that they can have their preferred or proper name displayed on their one card and that it will also be listed in the commencement program. Um, making personal connections with students might take practice or it may come naturally to you. Um, so, you know, you might be in either camp. What's tricky is finding the time, using the appropriate language and establishing boundaries with that. Um, so maybe not crossing 
the boundary is too far. Um, so some other tips for creating some personal connections um, is just using students' names in general. Uh, make eye contact um, if you're comfortable doing so. I know that there are some um, issues with eye contact if you, you know, are, are on the autism spectrum, for example, um, and that might make your students feel uncomfortable as well. So that's part of getting to know your students and their comfort levels. But use their name at the very least when you talk to students. Um, if you're bad with names, have students use name tense. Um, if you have trouble pronouncing their names, ask students for a phonetic spelling or to record um, how, how to say their names so that you can learn how to pronounce their name and make that effort to pronounce their name correctly and learn that. Um, engage students in small group introductions during the first week of class so they can learn more about each other and start developing a sense of community and belonging in your class. Students are going to feel more comfortable coming to class and engaging and participating if they know their classmates. You could also send a short note uh, or an email to congratulate a student who did well on an early assessment or who made an improvement. You could reach out individually to students who are struggling or who maybe didn't do so well in an assessment and explain not only your willingness to help them, but provide a time when you can meet with them face to face or virtually. Check in on students who've missed class. Um, and to make that easier, you can, at the beginning of the semester, ask for maybe multiple ways to communicate with students. Um, you know, try emailing through their student email first. If they don't respond, try their, uh, the other preferred method of communication that they've shared with you. Uh, just be careful of, you know, FERPA regulations when using that outside communication. Uh, make yourself human to them as well. Share who you are. Offer some insight about yourself when it's relevant to whatever you're discussing in class and encourage your students to do the same. You could also post it about the instructor bio on Blackboard. I do that. That gives students some of your educational and professional background and, you know, maybe reveals something personal, but, you know, not too personal uh, to show them that you're a real person. Also acknowledge when you're struggling. You don't have to overshare, but letting students know when you're struggling or experiencing hard times will help show them that it's okay for them to do the same. Students are also going to struggle. Acknowledge their struggles as well. It could be just as simple as saying, I know you're having a hard time, I'm keeping you in my thoughts. Also provide support for students. It can be through regular office hours, uh, supplementary learning opportunities, like a study group or something, um, formative assessments where you give feedback on that, timely responsiveness to their emails, so if they email you not waiting a week, to respond to their email, you know, getting a timely response there, 24, 48 hours, whatever your policy is for your course, um, or even referring them to external supports for issues that you're not equipped to handle, such as, you know, mental illness, uh, financial difficulties, health conditions, safety issues. So know when it's kind of outside of your purview and help them find the help that that they need in those cases. Um, and then speaking of office hours, try to remove as many barriers um, as you can to students meeting with you. Offer a variety of times, for example, format structures for the meeting. Um, you could offer it at different times of the day. You could provide options for virtual meetings or face-to-face, -face, phone, text, email. Um, you could also give them the option to meet individually or in groups. So, you know, if, if a group of students is having, you know, the same difficulty, they could choose to meet together as a group to get help as well. So imagine that you're, you're asked to be part of, you know, a grant writing team. And the only information that you get is just a vague idea about the time commitment and maybe vague ideas of what a successful proposal would look like and then, okay, go do it. So it'd probably be stressful, right? And similarly, if you have a lack of clear expectations in your course, your students are going to be stressed out. So some questions that you want to consider are, you know, what's the structure of your due dates? Uh, what does success look like in your class? How is the course organized? Does it make sense? Um, what will the workload look like from week to week so students can plan for that? So if you make sure that your expectations are clear to students from the start of your course are to include both semester goals and maybe even daily or weekly objectives in your syllabus. Um, provide a schedule of deadlines for your major assignments or exams and try to stick to those as much as possible. 
um, give clear instructions and requirements for every assignment so students know exactly what is expected of them. Be transparent about how students will be graded. So for example, you could use a grading rubric and then share that with students when they're assigned the task. Um, you can align your exam questions with those daily or weekly objectives that you developed and included in the syllabus. Um, and then that's also kind of a, a good alignment exercise for yourself. So if any questions that you, you have in your exams don't align with those stated objectives um, of things that you've covered, then you probably don't want to include those questions. You'll want to make note of that misalignment and then consider revising those objectives um, and the learning materials for the next semester so that you could include those questions later if those are important things that you want covered. Um, and then also design your course content so that students can find what they're looking for. So approach your course design, especially if you're teaching an online course or you have online components to your face-to-face -face course, um, which I think is fairly common these days. At least I have a, a robust online presence in my face-to-face -face courses. Um, but approach your course design from a student's perspective. If I know nothing about this course, am I going to know where to go when I log into the course online? Make it so that it's very easy for students to find what they're looking for. You can organize your course around, you know, objectives or around, you know, the unit that you're in or weekly schedules, for example, uh, dates. Um, so whatever is going to be easiest um, and make sense for your course. So elaborating on one of those things and fairness and grading. Um, that's another important component to inclusivity and, and, and equity in teaching is, is developing a fair, consistent, and clear grading structure. Um, so you might be an advocate for rigor in your classes. Uh, that may lead to an assumption that your goal in grading is to weed out the students that don't belong or can't hack it in the discipline. Some clues that this is a faculty member's grading style, even if they don't express it in that way, might be a syllabus statement stating what percentage of students will earn an A in the course and what percentage can expect to fail. Um, it might even involve ranking students or grading students relative to one another's performance rather than a set of predetermined criteria. So the message to students when educators express or demonstrate this mindset is that we don't see each student as capable of success and that our goal is to sort students out who can succeed and those who just can't. And that reinforces the fixed mindset that we're trying to against as inclusive educators. It also feeds into students' insecurities and feeling those feelings of imposter syndrome that I mentioned, which is also not conducive to learning and succeeding in any course. So for courses where this is the approach to grading, who do you think is most likely to do well? Well, the answer is going to be students who already do well in high stakes situations, who have time for test prep training or study groups or who don't have outside work or caregiving responsibilities. So in other words, students who already feel like they belong. And this kind of grading practice communicates exclusion to our students, not inclusion. It also works against creating that sense of community in our course because students are competing for those few coveted spots at the top. Students who don't have the confidence that they'll get one of those top spots might feel discouraged from even trying to do well in the course. They may just withdraw from the course entirely. So don't, we don't want to create unnecessary obstacles to student success. What we want to do is provide clear fair grading guidelines and make sure that students know what mastery or success in the course and on individual assessments looks like. Another way uh, to practice inclusivity and equity in our courses is to ensure that we align our content with what students care about or are interested in. So consider the course material um, and the diversity of the students in your class. When you find out more about your students, you can come up with content, readings, and skills that might be engaging to them. Put yourself in your students' shoes. Ask yourself, why should they care about this? Why should a student, for example, from a rural farming community care about what I'm teaching in this, this math course? How can I make it relevant to them? Um, why should a military veteran studying to become an accountant care about this literature course? How can I make this relevant to this person? Um, additionally, add diverse perspectives to your course content. Uh, expand your reading list to include different ethnic, racial perspectives in a case study, for example, um, or make sure your PowerPoints include diverse examples and images. Uh, don't tokenize particular students or representations, but do help students imagine themselves within your learning scenarios, specifically 
and the discipline more broadly. Uh, and then finally, you could use an interest survey to find out more about your students and their interests and backgrounds. You could ask about their plans for the future, their, their work experience, uh, what they're concerned about in the course, what they're interested in discovering, and so on. So I'm sure a lot of us have used the active learning technique of think, pair, share. Uh, it's pretty common. But sometimes we forget about that thinking part, and we expect students to start sharing with each other right away. So the thinking component is where the inclusivity and equity comes in. It allows students the time to form their thoughts before they pair up and share those thoughts with one another. Some students come up with things to say relatively quickly, while for others it may take more time to organize and articulate those thoughts. Giving all students time to think and write down some ideas before you pair them up and have them share is a really important step in the process and helps us avoid you know, the, the trap that we sometimes fall into with this of the quick thinking students monopolizing the discussion while others feel overwhelmed, left behind, um, and maybe even, you know, uncertain about what they think and intimidated. Um, so it, it may also help us avoid students blindly accepting their peers' ideas before they've really had a chance to consider what they think. And then finally, it reinforces the idea that everyone's contributions are valuable and worth waiting for. There's some discomfort in the silence of that thinking part. We tend not to like that silence. We tend to try to fill silence up. But we should resist that temptation. So try to embrace the silence so that students learn that thinking takes time, so that they get comfortable taking their time to think about what they have heard before they formulate their response. And you can also, you know, if you really feel that, that urge to jump in there, use a timer to control the silence so that you don't give in to that urge to cut it short prematurely. So some faculty uh, may consider structure as hand-holding, but we want to resist that impulse to just dismiss structure. Without structure, our course goals may be accomplished or they may not. Um, they may be accomplished for some students and they may not for others. More structure works for most students and it doesn't hurt those who don't need it. Less structure doesn't really affect the students who don't need the structure but it does limit the learning of those who need that added structure. So if we wanna be inclusive and equitable educators, we need to lean into the approach that will serve the most students, and that is more structure. Students have different cultural backgrounds, different personalities, social supports, learning differences, competence levels, and adding that structure to our courses allows us to reach those students. Low structure teaching methods might include things like lecturing, uh, calling on students. They're sometimes used to identify weak students, um, and those students wind up left behind. They're excluded from learning. Discomfort with learning is a distraction from learning. So if a student has anxiety about, be, about being called out in front of the entire class, that discomfort is going to distract the student from their learning experience. Um, another practice of low structure courses is prioritizing high stakes assessments without providing opportunities to practice and receive feedback. So incorporating more low stakes formative assessments with helpful feedback would benefit all students and add that needed structure. In addition to building a structure into the course design, you could also build structure into specific assignments. So make sure that your assignments clearly convey expectations, including the parameters, the, the media, the genre, the purpose, the audience. What are the criteria for success on this particular assessment or this formative or, or summative assessment? So if more structure is built into the assignment and those expectations are clear, students are more likely to succeed and less likely to think of the assignment as just trying to read the instructor's mind. Um, if your classes are like mine, it can kind of be like pulling teeth to get students to speak up in the whole class discussion. But smaller groups are a lower pressure way for students to share their ideas and I found them to work well in my own classes. Students who were you know staring at their desks when I asked a question of the whole class um, are animatedly expressing their perspectives with two or three of their classmates in a small group. So while students are sharing in small groups, I tend to walk around, listen in on what the groups are saying, chime in to encourage their ideas, particularly for students who, who tend not to speak up in the whole class discussion. Um, one thing that might help with the structure of small groups, so again, adding that structure in, is to have some rules established, whatever works, uh, makes sense for your class. Um, so for example, 
they need to exchange names before they begin sharing ideas and that may become less necessary as the semester goes on if they start you know getting to know each other better um, they don't need to necessarily you know exchange names if they already know everybody in the group um, but definitely towards the beginning of the semester um, they should put away their cell phone or laptop they um, might you might require them to take notes on what each other's saying um, but also, you need to build in some structure yourself. So give them clear instructions for what they're supposed to be discussing. Uh, you can have this on a handout. You can have it up on the screen. Provide that information in multiple ways. Don't just give uh, oral directions, for example. Have something written that they can also refer to. And that'll also ensure inclusion for students with um, auditory disabilities, with learning disabilities, or with language barriers. Um, and then finally, include accountability measures for the small group work, too, uh, to ensure that students are accomplishing what they need to. So for example, they could submit a shared document or a worksheet, um, or they could turn in the notes they took on what their group members said. You can also consider um, including more students in discussion by using anonymity. So consider including participation in your course, in other words, that allows for anonymity for those students maybe with anxiety or insecurity or shyness or even minority opinions to feel comfortable sharing their ideas and their viewpoints. So for, for instance, a student with a conservative viewpoint might not feel comfortable participating in class discussion if they feel like everyone else in the class has a liberal viewpoint. Um, so a couple ways to use anonymous inclusion would be having students submit anonymous responses on a note card or on a sheet of paper, have them swap a few times, and then students can read those viewpoints aloud without knowing whose is whose. Um, a couple of ways to do that using technology would be using anonymous surveys online, or you could use uh, classroom response systems like, like clickers or web polls, um, or using discussion boards with the option to remain anonymous. So one thing that we want to try to avoid uh, is talking throughout the entire class period. Um, so how do you know if your students are learning, if they're, all they're doing is listening to you? So evaluating whether they're learning, providing opportunities to demonstrate their learning in real time are important ways to make sure that students are progressing towards our learning outcomes. Um, one way to assess student learning would be like a low stakes quiz or assessment, and that would allow you to obtain evidence about their learning for all of your students uh, and to identify when even a small number of students aren't learning so that you can change your approach to include those students. Um, you could also include typical question, uh, test questions in your classes. Uh, that'll help students see what the caliber and the types of questions are that they can expect on major assessments. Um, and it also gives you the chance to assess students' mastery of those concepts before they take that high stakes exam. And then if students need extra support, either as a whole or individually, you can identify that and you can provide them with those supports. Um, and you can also assess students before and after class. So for example, you could give students a vocab quiz before class to see whether they understand the terminology that you're going to use during the lesson. And if, you know, there's, there's some gaps there, then you can address those at the beginning of the lesson before you really get into it. Um, or you can assign a formative assessment, asking them to, after class, asking them to apply what they learned from that class's lesson. And those pre and post class assessments can definitely help students build effective study habits. Um, and one important guideline for those assessments is that you should require them so that you do have more information about students learning, uh, all of your students learning, and so that students have a more realistic idea of their own learning as well. And then having a single exam or paper that carries a ton of weight in the student's course grade risks letting that one experience destroy a, a student's grade, creates unnecessary stress, and can impede their learning. So a more inclusive approach uh, would be to downplay high stakes work. Um, you could offer alternatives. Um, you could op offer to let them drop a quiz grade, let them bring an exam. Uh, let them replace some of the weight of a major assessment with multiple smaller assessments. You could rethink, you know, how you weight your grades in your course. So ask yourself just whether your grading scheme is allowing students to learn and grow 
or whether it could possibly be sabotaging, sabotaging their learning and making them feel like they don't belong or they just can't succeed. So how can we, um, in other words, assess in such a way that um, we're including our students, that we're, we're trying to support their learning? So uh, another easy way to find out, um, to include students in the process of their learning and to find out what they think about your course and whether it's helpful, uh, whether they're, they're learning, is to submit a, a mid-semester survey. Um, so you, at the beginning of the semester, you could um, also survey your students, ask them what makes them feel included in a course, then you could check in at the mid-semester, find out whether they think anything could be improved, um, whether there are any meaningful changes that you can make for the second half of the course. Um, and then also ask them, you know, in what ways you conveyed that you cared about their learning. Um, that would be a, a great way to get them to identify things that are working for them. Um, and then maybe if they don't mention something that you think you've been doing, then maybe you need to make that a little bit more explicit. Um, so you can do this anonymous, anonymously. You can do an anonymous online survey. If you're in Blackboard Original Course View, there is an anonymous survey option. Um, otherwise, you can use, you know, if you're using Ultra Course View, you can use a Qualtrics to um, submit your survey and, and share the link to that Qualtrics survey in your course um, or send it individually to students via email. Um, but uh, definitely anonymous surveys are going to, to help students feel more comfortable opening up um, and identifying truthfully the ways that the course is, is helping them learn and the ways that it may be impeding their learning. So um, rigor is, is a, a word that's thrown around a lot and um, there's a great article that recently came out um, by Jordan Jack and VG Safi um, called It's Time to Cancel the Word Rigor. Um, and so I just kind of want to address that a little bit as well, because I think that that idea of rigor um, does sometimes get in the way of being an inclusive creator. Um, so, Basically, they say that a lot of faculty members think that a challenging course should be sort of like an obstacle course. You're setting up these tasks, the student has to finish them to a certain standard within a certain time. Only, if only a few students can do that, that means my course is rigorous. Um, but that's, that's not an inclusive approach to teaching. Um, so, Rigor uh, tends to lay blame on an individual when it's the academic system that's creating these barriers to learning. Um, but we can't just, you know, eliminate the word without actually addressing what's behind that word. Um, so they include some maybe comments um, that instructors might say. So um, they say that. Uh, as instructors in humanities, they, the, these two faculty members who wrote this, as instructors in humanities and science field, uh, we both encounter damaging ideas about the concept uh, of rigor at workshops and even in casual conversations. Um, they say, for some instructors, abandoning rig rigorous policies and assignments means lowering standards and watering down courses. And they've heard comments like, um, I really want my students to engage in deep analysis and thinking. How can they do that if I just tell them that what they have to do isn't that doing the assignment for them? Um, or uh, that instructor has too many high grades on their exams. They're obviously not being rigorous enough. I'm not here to handhold them. How will they fare in the real world if I don't ask them to do it now? Um, so basically what those perspectives do is they privilege students who already have high academic literacy. Um, they already they already understand the unofficial, the unwritten rules of higher education, that hidden curriculum, in other words. Um, but a lot of our students don't know what that hidden curriculum is. They don't have that 
that background. They don't have that knowledge. So we need to um, become more inclusive educators and really do away with that idea that um, in order for a course to be seen as rigorous, a certain number of students need to fail um, or only a certain number of students should pass or should do well in this course for it to be considered rigorous. Um, and if too many students are doing well, we're not doing a good job as, as uh, educators, which seems counterintuitive to me. Um, so in the article, a few of the ideas um, that they have for having high standards while also ensuring inclusive teaching practices um, are to stop using the term rigor. Um, especially if you're using that as code for some certain students deserve to be here and some students don't. Um, so students who've been admitted to NIU belong here. So we should be treating them like they belong here and we should be supporting their learning. Um, also incorporate frequent low stakes tasks to help students practice course concepts and skills. Um, so, you know, if you're just lecturing all the time and then you're expecting students to uh, analyze something in a major assessment, but they haven't been asked to analyze anything up until now, they've just been memorizing things and trying to recall things, um, then how successful are they going to be at that analysis? So we need to, you know, scaffold that learning to add those low stakes tasks to help them practice the concepts and skills and get feedback on them before they're assessed on them. Um, also, they advocate for course design principles that provide clear course expectations, um, help, this is more kind of global, help our departments or campuses adopt policies that move away from grading on a curve, offer research and advice on grading alternatives such as mastery-based grading or contract grading, so different ideas for how to grade um, and there's, there's ungrading as well, so there's a ton of different um, kind of approaches to grading or not grading out there too, um, and different uh, rationales for them. Um, and then finally, they say to push against outdated notions of rigor personally and in the presence of others, to look for opportunities um, to intervene in institutional policies that seek to weed out students rather than invite them in and include them. So we definitely want our courses to um, help students master our course concepts um, and skills that are important to our fields. We want to set high standards. We want to help our students meet those standards. So start with the assumption that all of our students are capable of success. Don't try to weed students out. And if we do our jobs right, then all of our students should succeed. So I mentioned at the beginning um, of the workshop this diversity, equity, and inclusion educators toolkit. Um, and I'll share this with you in the chat here, but I'm also going to, to show it on the screen. Let's see here. Here we go. Sorry, I have three screens up, so I'm trying to pick the right one. All right. So this is what uh, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Educators Toolkit looks like for NIU's social justice education. Um, and you can filter topics up here and skip to them. But I just wanted to give you an idea of the different resources that are available to you um, that you can use. Um, so it talks about navigating classroom dynamics, um, you know, managing hot moments in the classroom, for example, ground rules for dialogue, um, activities in the classroom, um, dealing with microaggressions, bias, um, inclusive statements for syllabi. I mentioned that at the beginning of the workshop that you might want to include those in your syllabus. So that includes the accessibility statement, uh, name and pronoun statement, uh, student sexual misconduct policy, and sexual misconduct prevention and resources. But there's also a multilingual student statement here and an undocumented student statement. 
Um, and then some resources on culturally responsive teaching and some other websites and reading recommendations as well. So I just thought I would share that with you um, as an extra resource, uh, as a, the toolkit that um, social justice education has put together for all of us. All right, so now we have about nine minutes left. So if anyone has questions or comments or, or anything like that, you can feel free to either share them in a the chat or you can just turn on your microphone as well. All right, well, I will stick around in case anyone has questions, um, but I will send you this list of resources here, obviously not, not ex exhaustive, but um, our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Educators Toolkit um, has a lot of resources there. The, uh, so does the AQ Inclusive Teaching Practices Toolkit, um, and then VG Sathy and Kelly Hogan have some resources at the end of their article, um, as do Jordan, Jack, and VG Sathy. Um, so I will send this, these links to these resources for you as well as the link to today's um, session recording from YouTube. Um, and if you have any questions after this, you can feel free to contact me uh, anytime. It could be you know, questions about anything that we've covered today. It can be questions about anything teaching related. Um, so it's just amanda.smothers at niu.edu. Uh, and I'd be happy to help you out with, with any of that. Um, and if you think of anything afterward, you can re re respond to my, um, my follow-up email or you can just email me directly too. Um, so thanks everyone for, for joining me today to talk about demonstrating inclusivity and equity in your course. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me um, and I will send an email to everyone who attended today's workshop. Have a great week, everyone.